Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my November 2020 reading wrap-up. I actually attempted to film this video last night, but uh, the quality of the video was completely corroded. I think because I had too many other uh, videos on my camera, which I then had to delete, as well as that corroded video that uh, would have just sputtered and died out and they wouldn't have been able to hear anything and just seen a lot of staticky images. So anyway, I am back now to try and ramble out uh, the same thing I just did. <laughs> Fun times. Uh, so let's uh, get to it, I guess. Uh, I don't usually do reading wrap-ups like this because I try to do weekly uh, updates on what I'm reading, usually Friday reads when I can get there on time, which I'm hoping to this month. But in November, I didn't do any Friday reads because I was doing NaNo. That being said, I talked about most of these books in my NaNoWriMo vlogs, so <laughs> you might have heard about some of them uh, there. And you can find out more about them in my literary newsletter, which just went live. Uh, every month I write a literary newsletter where I highlight uh, literary news of <laughs> around uh, the interwebs that caught my fancy. I have a book pick, I have a book meme, I have a TBR, and I have snippets of all the Goodreads reviews of the books I've read that month. So that would be the six books I'm about to ramble about here. <laughs> so, anyway, getting to it. The first book I read this month was for my mom and aunties and one honorary uncle uh, book club. I think he was the one who really uh, chose this book. This was The Inheritance of Loss by Kieran Desai. I think a lot of the reason he liked it is because it uh, talked a lot about the lives and portrayed the lives of downtrodden people halfway across the globe. So not the type of people you usually hear about in U.S. discourse. Uh, this is a sprawling novel. It's a Booker Prize winner from 2006. Uh, it takes place in India near the Himalayas. There is a lot of cultural unrest between ethnic groups there. A lot that's been stirred up thanks to the British colonialism. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, strife is between people, in fact, who are, you know, sort of more Indian ethnically uh, identified and those Indians who have been uh, raised in British institutions and are sort of more Western in their outlooks. And so the main family uh, has a lot of those people and a lot of caste issues. Uh, and they're living through this tumultuous sort of Civil War time where at one point their house is briefly occupied and uh, the young girl of the family gets involved with a guy who ends up becoming a nationalist. And then we go to America for a storyline uh, in Manhattan where um, the cook in this family, his son is in America as an illegal immigrant and is buttressing up against other illegal immigrants, most of whom are cast offs from other like uh, pre post colonial uh, societies uh, in the third world who have come to America because there's so few prospects at home to make a good living. So really colonialism and a commentary on the ill effects on society of colonialism is a huge uh, draw of this book, and I think more of a draw than the characters, which for me, you know, made this book a little bit of a struggle, because although I'm interested in all of this thematic stuff, uh, characters are really my entryway in, and I, I didn't really uh, feel like the characters were interesting enough on their own beyond uh, sort of the heavy-handed uh, messaging. Uh, Although the writing was beautiful and uh, India as a country was a sprawling, uh, majestic, and, and, and highly uh, active, I would say, uh, character in and of herself, like a, sort of a romantic uh, capital R uh, India in these pages about... Uh, it even made me think of sort of the wild India that, you know, col col colonists might have fallen for throughout the ages. So. Uh, I mean, it's an impressive work on that scale. I guess that's the sort of thing that often uh, get, gathers buzz in a literary uh, prize capacity. But uh, in, broadly speaking, generally speaking, I guess uh, it didn't grab me as much because it wasn't as much of a character book. Next, well, what do you know? With my next two books, I inadvertently participated in my first nonfiction November. <laughs> Uh, nonfiction November is something uh, I've been getting more and more interested in because I've been 
reading steadily more and more nonfiction while being on booktube. But in general, I figured I'd never actually participate because November is also NaNoWriMo and I'm so busy with NaNo that I feel like I don't want to challenge myself with too difficult of books, playing into that stereotype again, of course, that all nonfiction has to be difficult, which of course uh, all the nonfiction people tell me isn't true and they'd be right. <laughs> and it certainly is the case with the two books that I read uh, this month which are the two Buttigieg books, which I decided to put on my list because they were briefly part of the Goodreads Choice Awards for the semifinals, so I thought uh, it would be fun to actually read them and see if I'd like to vote for them. So, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the uh, list of prompts for Nonfiction November 2020 and, uh, you know, retroactively pretend that I did all of this by design. <laughs> okay, so for I have something to tell you by Chastin Buttigieg. I am using the words time and discovery because this is a memoir, so by default it's about someone's movement through the time of his life. <laughs> which I guess I also could just be lazy and say it's also about discovering things about themselves, which specifically in this novel, uh, the major discovery for Chastin Buttigieg is of his sexual identity coming to terms with uh, who he is and uh, where he fits in larger society and how to sort of deal with uh, elements, especially of uh, his childhood society, that uh, aren't as open to the idea or weren't as open or so he thought when he was younger to the idea of homosexuality. Uh, so that's a major impetus of this is him coming to terms with that uh, part of his identity. And then there is a very significant part of the book uh, that is about meeting Mayor Pete and about the marriage and about the campaign trail and sort of entering that broader world in a way beyond even his own identity as a gay man to uh, understand broader gay issues and then broader issues of how politics affect everybody. And uh, he just sort of uh, gets into this intersectionality and uh, analyzes a lot of things that he uh, believed to be true in his rural Michigan upbringing a, a, around predominantly uh, white people like himself that uh, in a broader context he realizes uh, life is more complicated and he sees more nuance. He's a deeply empathetic person. I really love that and how that comes out in this book that uh, even when it comes to him talking about the people who bullied him he has some understanding uh, mm -hmm for who they are uh, and uh, where they're coming from. I mean, I think a lot of that must come from the fact that he's talking about former middle schoolers and he was a middle school teacher later down the line. So uh, I really enjoyed this, uh, probably mostly because I enjoy the person or at least how he presents himself online uh, and that he is sort of our uh, millennial political spouse uh, figure up there on uh, the social medias. Uh, uh, and uh, I found his story to be touching. And the next book I have is Pete Buttigieg's nonfiction treatise Trust, and I am using the words buzz and movement, both of which, again, like in a lazy way, I would say, sound like political words for a politician. <laughs> Certainly, uh, Buttigieg is trying to build a buzz around the idea of how we as a country need to uh, have more trust in each other and trust in our institutions again. He also, uh, after uh, seceding his presidential run, uh, started a new PAC uh, called uh, Win the Era, which I guess technically might not have much to do with this book. I think specifically it's about uh, Pete trying to uh, elevate the voices of diverse uh, Democrats, <laughs> such as himself. But uh, anyway, I do think uh, there might be a call for a movement in this book. One of the major uh, things that uh, Buttigieg uh, calls out for is uh, the idea of returning to service in, in grand numbers, and broad numbers, because I think a lot of his own ideas about trust came from his service uh, in the Navy Reserves in Afghanistan and in a war zone having to, you know, immediately trust your lives to people you don't know well and you might not even have a lot in common with. Uh, so he likes the idea, even outside of a war zone, of people from disparate uh, identities in America getting together to learn how to get along which sounds especially nice in our fractured political reality. What I especially like, too, is that he is a millennial as well. We've been get, getting messages in uh, sociological books about America the melting pot and the idea of a national identity being about uh, ignoring your difference 
and like uh, treating it as you know foreign and other and you know as a Jew <laughs> that gets to me especially since I was used against Jews and Italians and other people you know even a hundred years ago but of course it's a millennial uh, you know he Pete understands intersectionality and the idea that you can have a national identity without getting rid of your differences um, so there's a lot in there about that, and of course there's a lot of acknowledgement of, you know, we're talking about American institutions that haven't always been fair to all of American citizens. And so that he's not ignoring that at all and just talking about how to best move on from there, and also without ignoring the past, which is, I think, a very, I think it's such a millennial thing, <laughs> I really do, that, you know, we don't try to whitewash the past about uh, the wrongs that have been done, uh, and I think maybe in a worst case scenario that turns into the worst parts of cancel culture or public shaming but i think in the best senses it uh makes sure that uh, we don't you know ignore the pain and suffering that uh you know doesn't only live in the past you know the things that happened in the past influenced policy and social actions of the present and uh, and of and of the future so far and we have the opportunity now to look at these things honestly and to change things for the better and i feel like that's in this book as well although i'm certainly starting to ramble a bit but yeah again i i uh, i liked it i felt like uh this was a, a good treatise and something that i certainly need to embrace more in my own life being too cynical as i am but uh, i need to embrace the idea of trust and <laughs> so too do the rest of us Next, I turn to some lighter reading, uh, which actually, though, mirrors my first book, uh, The Inheritance of Loss, uh, because this is The Invitation by Ann Cherian, which is about predominantly uh, Indian Americans, uh, a group of friends who grew up in India and then went to grad school in America, uh, and then sort of loosely maintained their friendships, and then ultimately years later come back together when one of uh, the friends has a son graduating from MIT and he throws this huge lavish party mostly for himself <laughs> and the other friends are in more like uh, iffy places as it were and they're feeling like oh god I gotta go back and see my friends and they'll realize my life isn't as, isn't as amazing as I hoped it would be back in college but uh, here we go. So we have characters uh, dealing with uh, the fact that they thought they were living the high life or would be living the high life and have cushy jobs, but instead they're struggling to be in the middle class and their child is struggling in school, unlike, you know, the MIT kid. <laughs> uh, and then we have a third friend uh, who uh, married a Jewish man who had a midlife crisis. He used to be, you know, secular, but then his midlife crisis brought him back to Judaism and it kind of leaves her out in the cold. And that's how I found out about this book, actually, uh, years ago. Somebody reviewed it on the Jewish Book Council because of that very slight Jewish plot. And so I ended up still counting this as a Jewish book, even though it's really very little about Judaism at all, and that husband is not at all a POV character or anything, so, you know, we don't really get any side of his story, and the Judaism is all pretty flat and all of that, but <laughs> I'll take what I can get. <laughs> but otherwise, you know, there's a build-up and a lot of drama at the party. I mean, I think there was fascinating, interesting stuff in here. I mean, I liked the characters, I liked the reminder of the different ethnic groups uh, within India, and, you know, it was much easier to grasp in a straightforward narrative like this than the inheritance of loss. Uh, but ultimately, this was sort of soapy fun, and it, it was especially uh, a palatable read as I was struggling through NaNoWriMo <laughs> and struggling through saying that word, apparently. <laughs> and so it was nice to, if I had to read and wanted to read, to have something really fun and propulsive. So I'm very grateful for this book. But to return to something with a little more depth, I have Toni Morrison's penultimate novel, Home. Uh, this novel uh, goes back to mid-20th uh, century. Uh, she follows a male narrator, which is relatively unusual for her, and I think in a way that made the narrative a little more straightforward than it often is uh, with her female uh, protagonists. It's something she wrote about in her uh, prologue to Song of Solomon, in fact, or, uh, or intro, as it were. But anyway, this uh, protagonist is a man named Frank. He was a veteran in the Korean War, but as a black man, he comes home to his home country and finds that uh, white people are, you know, upset by this fact because, you know, it challenges them and offends them in their idea of, you know, treating black people as inferior when, you know, you're supposed to treat veterans, you know, as an honored class. Uh, and they don't want to treat the black people as an honored class. So anyway, he, you know, runs into prejudice through that angle. 
Uh, and then he has to go to his hometown to save his sister from uh, something else that sort of feeds into, uh, you know, the dark underbelly of uh, things that uh, black people were dealing with, uh, particularly in that time period. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, commentary on, on those socio-political issues to the point where I read a Guardian article where they said actually this novel is really just violence and misery for the sake of it. And I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, you just get into Morrison's characters and realize how multifaceted they are, and uh, her writing remains exactly the same as it always has been, I think. I mean, even, you know, whether her narrator is a man or a woman, her writing is just very lyrical and deep and lush and uh, really draws you into that world. I mean, maybe it's a toe dip in because her novels are always very short. It's not supposed to be a deep dive of... Uh, you know, socioeconomic uh, contemplation. It's just supposed to give you sort of a brief look through the eyes of these characters. But I feel like uh, this one succeeded as well as uh, most of her others uh, in talking about what Frank and his sister C were going through uh, and what it meant uh, to what it meant to these people to have a home in various senses. I mean that uh, they grew up in this small town with. Uh, a step-grandmother who was actually rather um, dismissive of them for, for reasons uh, that are explored in the book and that actually their family was uh, run out of their former hometown in a pogrom type uh, s a situation uh, which could also be common uh, for, for black Americans at the time. Um, so yeah, I mean it's a small short treatise on the idea of home for these characters and uh, I, I thought it was uh, an interesting glimpse. But I have to say, I think my favorite novel of the month is one I haven't talked about much on here because I just read it. I did uh, talk about it briefly when I chose it through my page 112 tag a couple weeks ago. But anyway, it is Strangers and Cousins by Leah Hager Cohen. Because I guess this is a mix of all of it, you know? It has a lot of thematic elements and also richly drawn characters, complexity and nuance and enough heft to, you know, include all of that in, in a deep and meaningful way. So I really liked this book. I was surprised by how much I liked it. I mean, I thought I liked page 112, but in fact, I think I liked all the rest of the pages even better. You know, I, you know, you read page 112 and you come to the book with certain biases and expectations, and I thought I understood the characters, but they turned out to be much deeper than I thought they were, and their relationships to one another to be more interesting than I thought they were. So anyway, the crux of the novel takes place in five days leading up to a wedding. Uh, we're following the uh, Erland slash Blumenthal family. They live in this house in a small town, Rundle Junction, New York, uh, which uh, politically is going through a little upheaval because a heredity or ultra-orthodox uh, family moved in and uh, is generally uh, starting to see an influx of more uh, ultra-orthodox or heredity uh, people move in and uh, that would change the makeup a lot of the town and there's a lot of backlash against that. And there's a lot of questioning in this book about what is that? Is that anti-Semitism? Is it legitimate because of, you know, the uh, insularity of the Heredia community and how they don't mesh with everyone else? Uh, and what does this have to do with uh, the past? Because, uh, you know, and uh, how Rundle Junction has seen itself throughout history because in fact, uh, Back a hundred years ago, or roughly a hundred years ago, a little less, uh, there was a big fire at a pageant that was uh, meant to, you know, express unity. There was this fire, it might have been arson, it might have not been. It ended up killing 18 children, and this uh, foreign Jewish man was blamed and run out of town. Uh, so, you know, it goes back to uh, past actions and past history a bit, and uh, how we view the other in society. Uh, so that's uh, on the you know, on one level. Uh, another level is that uh, the daughter Clem getting married is marrying her lesbian lover. Uh, and in a nice change of pace, uh, only one family member who doesn't even appear in the book uh, directly is, you know, homophobic, hob homophobic about it. <laughs> Although there are issues of race that come into the marriage because uh, she's uh, in entering into an interracial marriage. There's also issues just thematically through this book about uh, the idea of relationships and longevity um, because this book uh, talks about the past and the present, but also the future. It shows us some future storylines for these people, and it talks about how relationships grow and change uh, throughout time in a way that I found personally meaningful, because <laughs> I think I have a lot of personal angst about the idea of uh, 
the death of relationships and what that means. And so this book went into a little bit of that. I did struggle with a few aspects of this book, particularly I think Cohen uh, took it a little far when she started talking about a family of mice. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I think she was trying to use it as like another metaphor about, you know, the mice have lived there just as long as the humans. It's another group of strangers and cousins, as it were. But, uh, you know, in one aspect, I always kind of find it fascinating to, you know, see this alien uh, animal culture. But in the other aspect, you know, I think the focus of the story maybe should have remained on the people. <laughs> And also in that vein, I think uh, the climax had a few too many dramatic uh, events happen at once, and a few of them we could have taken out. I, you know, obviously we needed some for the sake of uh, continuity and, uh, you know, recurring themes, but we didn't need all of them. All of them was a little too much overkill, and it did that horrible Catch-22 thing in fiction where it reminded me this wasn't real life but a book. Uh, and that's saying something, because through a lot of the book, I was so engrossed in the complexity of the characters and the situations that, you know, I thought this is a lot like real life, how I view it anyway, until we get to that overkill stuff. <laughs> so anyway, overall, I'm just really impressed. I'm just really glad that I finally sat down and read this one. So that about covers it for me now. Uh, you can find me back on this channel. Hopefully tomorrow I will post my very final NaNoWriMo vlog. And from there on, I will mostly be back to doing, you know, bookish talk again. I want to film a new 100, page 112 tag video. You know, I enjoyed them anyway. And after the success of that last book, I'm especially excited to give it another go. And beyond that, uh, I want to get back into my Friday reads, hopefully on time for the final week, uh, month of uh, 2020. On time would be nice. And I have a whole bunch of other books that I hope to get through before uh, the end of the year. So I hope you are all also excited about your reading uh, for this month and uh, are excited about what you're anticipating for um, for January, which you know is another video I'll be doing down the line, so stay tuned. Uh, but anyway, thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.